This video here would summarize uh, the different types of transport mechanisms that you would need to know in AS. Uh, as you can see, the mind map is quite busy. There is a lot of stuff on this. Um, however, actually, I've made separate videos detailing um, certain things within the different mechanisms. Uh, there would be one video on diffusion, one video on active transport, and one video on osmosis as well. So feel free to check those out. But this one here hopefully gives you an overview picture of the different types of transport mechanisms for some very quick revision. So we're going to first of all think about there are two general types of transport mechanism, one that is passive, one that is active. Passive transport means that they do not need energy. Active transport means that they need energy. As you can see here, there are two separate types of passive transport. One is diffusion and one is osmosis. And for, active um, for the active mechanisms, we have active transport and bulk transport as well. But we're going to go to into them a in a bit more detail later on. So first of all, let's look at diffusion. So even within diffusion, you can separate them into simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Now, most of the time when we just simply say diffusion, we automatically uh, assume that you are talking about simple diffusion, which means that there's not necessarily need barrier to allow those things to pass through. But generally speaking, diffusion is about the net movement of particles down the concentration gradient. So net means general or overall, because particles ha un um, actually obey what we call the Brownian motion rule. They uh, have a completely random uh, direction of movement. But we say in diffusion, generally speaking, most of the particles will travel from a high concentration area to a low concentration area until you reach about equilibrium, where there's about the same amount of particles e on either side. For simple diffusion, you don't need a barrier, so it could be things like if you spring a perfume or deodorant in the room, it will slowly spread across the room. But it can also be applied on certain things that could diffuse across a membrane uh, as easy as that without relying on other protein channels. But if it's something that is small and is polar, then they would need to do facilitated diffusion, which is diffusion across channel proteins. So these are things such as uh, water, and different types of mineral ions would use facilitated diffusion. And it, in this case, the membrane would be described as selectively permeable because we have channel proteins being specific to certain uh, molecules only. As you can see in this picture here, you can, you've got an area with high concentration and an area of low concentration. It doesn't necessarily need to go through, um, it doesn't need to have a barrier in here, but just to make it clearer of the two areas, you can see if diffusion happens, then I will eventually reach uh, equilibrium where there's about the same amount on either side. So that is diffusion or facilitated diffusion in general. Uh, you need to be aware of some of the factors that increase the rate of diffusion. So number one, if it's through a membrane, the thinner the membrane, the shorter diffusion distance, the quicker it will be. Uh, examples would be things like uh, in at the alveoli or the villi. Uh, they are, the walls are one cell thick, therefore is a very short diffusion distance. In certain cases, if you have a higher surface area or surface area to volume ratio, the, uh, the diffusion will be quicker as well. Uh, notice the difference between surface area and surface area to volume ratio. Um, if you're thinking about a particular structure within the body, then uh, such as villi or the alveoli, then we will use surface area to describe it. But if you're thinking about an individual cell, Right, it could be uh, a unicellular organism or a particular cell within the body, like the red blood cell, then you would talk about surface area to volume ratio. So again, uh, with those examples like alveoli and villi, it's about higher surface area, therefore faster diffusion. If you increase the temperature of the particular condition, the diffusion will be quicker as well because you're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. They vibrate more, they move around more, therefore they would naturally move to a lower concentration area quicker. Then uh, the last one would be a steeper concentration gradient. That means um, if the difference in the terms of concentration across the two areas is bigger, then diffusion would happen much quicker. However, if I've actually, I, I do have a little bit more particles here compared to this one, but not maybe just one or two particles extra, then diffusion doesn't happen as quickly. So these are four factors that affect diffusion. And that would be uh, the general concept of diffusion there. Now, another type of passive transport would be osmosis. Uh, some people will summarize it as diffusion of water, but this is the actual definition. The net movement of water molecules 
down the water potential gradient through the partially permeable membrane. So the uh, water, water potential, as summarized here, WP, uh, is referring to the pressure exerted by water molecules onto the wall of the container it is in. So it could be the, um, the cell membrane of, of the cell or the cell wall. So we say uh, water naturally moves from an area of high water potential, meaning there's lots of water in it, to an area with less water. But it's specifically through the partially permeable membrane, that's when we call osmosis. If water is moving uh, with an area with loads of water to an area with little water, but without going through the membrane, that's not osmosis, that's actually diffusion. So it's, uh, it's worth noting that difference there. And the key thing about osmosis is about how do we describe the different states of animal cells and plant cells, uh, depending on the type of solution it is in. So there are three types of solution. We can have hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic, um, as you can see here, which I have abbreviated. These three adjectives, hyper, hypo, and isotonic, um, is comparative, meaning that you're comparing the concentration of the solution compared to inside the cell, like the cell, uh, cell cytoplasm. So if, it's a, if the cell is in a hypotonic solution, it means that the surrounding solution has a much higher water concentration. It's got a lot more water compared to inside the cell. So therefore water will move into the cell. And if it's an animal cell, it will burst or we call it lysis. If it's a plant cell, it will become turgid. If it's in an isotonic solution, iso means the same. So therefore, uh, in an animal cell, we don't have a particular name for it. But if it's, uh, if it's a plant cell, we call it flaccid, where the uh, plasma membrane is just touching the cell wall. If it's in a hypertonic solution, it means that the surrounding solution has a much higher sugar or solute concentration compared to inside. In other words, hypertonic solution has much lower water concentration compared to inside the cell. So therefore, water would leave the cell. So in the case of animal cells, it would become shriveled, or we call them crenation. Or in the plant cell, it would be called plasmolyzed, where the plasma membrane becomes detached from the cell wall. There is a video that details this and shows you the pictures of them. I strongly recommend that you go uh, watch the video if you're not familiar with these particular key terms. So that is osmosis, about the movement of water molecules. So for diffusion and osmosis, they're both passive, meaning they don't need energy. Now we're going to look at active uh, mechanisms, which re does require energy. So the classic one would be active transport, which is by definition, the movement of particles against the concentration gradient using ATP as energy and the protein carrier. So as you can see in the picture here, then uh, I've got an area with low concentration of particles and an area of high concentration. Uh, we will need to have a protein carrier which actively uses energy to change its shape, or we call it, it undergoes confirmation of change, and it will pump the molecules across, eventually reaching a situation like this, where all of the particles on the low concentration area goes to the high one. And the process can be actually summarized in these five points there. Right, so we say the target molecule, let's say a particular ion, and ATP will bind to the carrier then ATP is hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP and an inorganic phosphate group. That inorganic phosphate group actually stays bound to the carrier itself, and that binding and the energy that was released from the ATP hydrolysis will cause a shape change, or we call them a conformational change of the carrier. So because the carrier is now open to the other side, it will release the target molecule and also the inorganic phosphate group. And once they have been released, the carrier protein would naturally return to its original shape, ready for the next target molecule and ATP to bind. And we say that this process is selective, meaning that uh, different uh, protein carriers would pick or transport only certain particular molecules. So we can have sodium-specific uh, protein carriers or potassium ion-specific protein carriers, uh, etc. So this is selective. Now, in certain cases, we need to transport uh, larger molecules or sometimes even whole cells. Uh, and in that case, we call it bulk transport, which is a form of a, uh, active transport, but only for larger uh, stuff in some sense. So endocytosis is generally about engulfing things into the cell. Exocytosis is about releasing uh, stuff out of the cell. For example, if you finish digesting a particular bacteria, 
、um, for white blood cells in this case, or perhaps the cell has made an extracellular enzyme that in which that it will need to secrete that out of cell by exocytosis. And the energy in this case is used to make vesicles and to make them fuse with the membrane. For endocytosis, if you're trying to get things into cell, for example, a whole bacterial cell, then、uh, we call that phagocytosis. If you're trying to engulf certain liquids, then it's called pinocytosis. So to summarize, transport mechanisms have two general types. We can have passive mechanisms, which doesn't require energy, or active ones, which do. So passive ones, we can separate them into diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion can be、uh, relatively simple, which doesn't necessarily need a barrier, or it could be a facilitated diffusion, which means that you、uh, the molecules have to go through a channel protein or a carrier protein. And diffusion is the net movement of particles down the concentration gradient, and this can be affected by different factors. We can depending on the thickness of the membrane, the surface area to volume ratio. Uh, temperature and the、uh, steepness of the concentration gradient. On the other hand, we've another passive mechanism is called osmosis, which is the net movement of water molecules down the water potential gradient through the partially permeable membrane. And、uh, in terms of、uh, animal cells and plant cells, when they are in different types of solutions, they will undergo slightly different changes. So it depends on if they have more or less water inside the cell, then the water will either move into the cell or out of cell by osmosis, leading to slightly different states of the animals and plant cells. Then, for active、uh, mechanisms, we can have active transport, which is a selective process where it is the、uh, movement of particles against the concentration gradient,、uh, using energy in the form of ATP and a protein carrier to do so. So、uh, we can have active transport, which is、uh, for slightly smaller molecules. But if we want to move bigger stuff,、uh, like whole cells, we will rely on bulk transport. If we're trying to engulf certain molecules or cells into a bigger cell, then it's endocytosis, and we can have phagocytosis or pinocytosis, depending on if it's a solid or liquid. Or if we can have exocytosis if we're trying to secrete certain things out of the cell. And they rely on the fusion of vesicles or the production of vesicles in order to do, the,、uh, in order to transport these larger、uh, substances. And there you have it. That is the summary of the transport mechanisms. If you want to have a bit more detail in for any of them, please feel free to check out some of the other videos that I've made for this particular chapter.